beautiful session of listening to others. Thank you, Amanda. I now request Ms. Suzanne Brito to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Pradeep Gokhale. Dr. Gokhale will speak on the role of Buddhism in nation building with reference to Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. It's my privilege to introduce today's esteemed speakers to you. Our first speaker is Dr. Pradeep Gokhale. He has taught in the philosophy department of Pune University for 31 years. After retiring, he worked as Dr. B. R. Ambedkar's research professor in the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, Sarnath, Varanasi. Presently, he is associated with the departments of Pali as well as the Department of Philosophy of Savitri Bhai Pune University as honorary adjunct professor. During his long academic career, he has authored several books in both English and Marathi, has contributed to international and national journals and anthologies on different aspects of Indian philosophy. Apart from all this, Dr. Gokhale has also published two books of poems. Thus, he is a very versatile personality. Sir, we are privileged to have you with us this morning. Honorable chairperson and friends, <coughs> uh, I have prepared my talk, uh, which I want to present uh, through PowerPoint presentation. So, I will start with a statement which may not be liked by some. <laughs> I believe that nation building is a narrow goal to be pursued by any religion. A religion is generally concerned with building up the whole humanity with noble values, moral as well as spiritual values. Since a religion is concerned with humanity at large, it is concerned with the institutions and communities which form parts of the humanity. At the same time, every religion has some material and psychological limitations. Any institutional religion cannot reach all the people and given the diversity of temperaments of the humans, any particular religious belief system cannot be appealing to all the people. Given that there are many and diverse religions, given that there are people with diverse temperaments, and given that there is freedom to follow and practice any religion, or no religion, inter-religious dialogue becomes the need of the hour. In fact, not only the dialogue between the religions is necessary, but also the dialogue between the religious and secular approaches is necessary. A healthy attitude to multi-religious and multicultural social reality needs to be developed at institutional, national, and international level. Mahatma Jyotiba Phule, in his Sarvajanik Satya Dharma Pustak, has introduced a model of interreligious harmony even within a single family. He says, Whichever religious scriptures have been written by the great saintly persons on this earth, they contain some truth relevant to their time according to their understanding. Hence, a woman in a family might read a Buddhist scripture and accept Buddhism as per her wish. In the same family, her husband may read Old and New Testament and become a Christian if he likes, and their daughter may read Quran and become a Muhammadan and their son may study Sarvajanik Satya Dharma and adopt it as his religion. These pa parents and their daughter and son while living in a family should not envy or hate each other's religion, but should believe that all of us are children of the common creator of all and should live with mutual love. This suggests that even the smallest social unit like a family needs to be built on a healthy and harmonious relation between religions and the concerned religions have to play their part in this harmony. A healthy dialogue between different religions is possible if there is a common shareable ground. It is well known that M.K. Gandhi advocated the doctrine of equality of all religions. But his notion of the equality of religions was God-centric. 
God centric notion of equality cannot be the common shareable ground of theis, as, theistic as well as atheistic religions. Ambedkar did not believe in equality of all religions, but he presented his comparative understanding of religions. While comparing religions, he accepted four parameters. They are reflected in his important essay, Buddha and the Future of His Religion, which was published in Mahabodhi Society Journal in 1950. One, religion should hold the society together through the sanction of morality. Two, religion must be in accord with science. Three, religion should recognize the tenets of liberty, equality, and fraternity. And four, religion should not sanctify or ennoble poverty. Ambedkar's choice of Buddhism was based on these parameters. Out of these parameters, the third parameter, namely the trio of principles, liberty, equality, and fraternity, is most important for our purpose as it is also included in the preamble of the Indian constitution. The three principles, namely liberty, equality, and fraternity, which Dr. B. R. Ambedkar calls Trinity, are central to democracy. According to Ambedkar, they form a union in the sense that a divorce, to divorce one from their union or to divorce one from the other is to defeat the very purpose of democracy. He was convinced that they were centrally important as the basic principles of an ideal society, an ideal democracy, and an ideal religion. Sometimes the principle of justice is also added to these three principles. For example, Ambedkar, after narrating the traditional approaches to Buddhism in the Buddha and his Dhamma, raises the question about the social message of the Buddha. There he asked the following questions. Did the Buddha teach justice? Did the Buddha teach liberty? Did the Buddha teach equality? Did the Buddha teach fraternity? However, in some other writings, Ambedkar regards justice as an inclusive principle and includes the trio of principles, namely liberty, equality, and fraternity in it. For example, he says in philosophy of Hinduism, if all men are equal, all men are of the same essence and the common essence entitled them to the same fundamental rights and to equal liberty, in short, Justice is simply another name for liberty, equality, and fraternity. This suggests that the trio of principles also form the basis of building a democratic India, according to Ambedkar. Buddhism, which is adopted and which he reconstructed through his work, Buddha and his Dhamma, was based on the same three principles. Hence, we find a peculiar convergence between the principles of a good religion and the principles of nation building in the thought of Dr. Ambedkar. Ambedkar's approach to the three principles should not be understood as a static approach, but a dynamic process. It is important to note how Ambedkar's theorization on the trio of principles developed. As an independent social thinker, he was concerned with the question of the exact nature of the three principles, their justifiability, and their interrelation. Through his writings, he tackled some issues concerning them and arrived at solutions to them. We can say that though his understanding of the principles did not undergo a radical change, it at least got matured and enriched in later formulations. Dr. Ambedkar has referred to these principles at different stages of his life. Ambedkar's earliest reference to the three principles can be found in his masterpiece, Annihilation of Caste, which he wrote in 1936. In this essay, he describes the three principles as foundations of an ideal society. Here, he refers to the French Revolution as the source of these principles. Also, at a later stage, when he wrote the Hindu social order, its essential principles, he discusses the three principles in the context of French Revolution. He refers to these principles again in his article, Buddha and the Future of His Religion, which was published in the Mahabodhi Society Journal, there he regards adherence to these principles as a criterion of ideal religion. He also claims that Buddhism fulfills this criterion. In his later writings, his understanding of these principles becomes more morally and religiously oriented. 
At this stage, Ambedkar said in 1954 on All India Radio, Positively, my social philosophy may be said to be enshrined in three words, liberty, equality, and fraternity. Let no one, however, say that I have borrowed my philosophy from the French Revolution. I have not. My philosophy has roots in religion and not in political science. I have derived them from the teachings of my master, the Buddha. According to me, this statement of Dr. Ambedkar should not be interpreted literally, but in the context of Ambedkar's intellectual development. Though Ambedkar initially discovered these principles in the slogan of the French Revolution, at his pro-Buddhist stage of intellectual development, he rediscovered them in Buddhism. This is how we can interpret the above statement of Dr. Ambedkar. Though Ambedkar makes a general claim that the three principles can be found in Buddhism, he does not make a systematic endeavor to show how all the three principles are rooted in Buddhism. In the next few slides, I will try to show the three, that the three principles can be traced in Buddhism as Ambedkar interpreted it. For this purpose, we will consider the following texts of Ambedkar. One is, of course, the Buddha and his Dhamma. Then his essay, Buddha or Karl Marx. Then his writing entitled Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Ancient India. Then Riddles of Hinduism and his essay, Buddha and the Future of His Religion. Sometimes we get explicit supporting references to some principles in some of the above texts. Sometimes we do not get explicit references, but some references suggestive of the principles. Sometimes Ambedkar refers to all the three principles collectively while discussing Buddhism. In his article, Buddha and the Future of His Religion, Ambedkar start, stated, consistency with the three principles as one of the criteria of the ideal religion and claimed that only Buddhism fulfills this criterion. In the Buddha and his Dhamma, he raises the questions such as, did the Buddha teach liberty, equality, fraternity, as we have already noted? He discusses these individual principles, however, in a scattered way. Among the three principles, we find explicit references to equality in Ambedkar's The Buddha and His Dhamma. We do not find the explicit reference to fraternity in The Buddha and His Dhamma, but we find Ambedkar in his riddles of Hinduism making remarks concerning the correlation between fraternity and Maitri. Again, we do not find explicit references to the principle of liberty in Buddhism as discussed by Ambedkar. However, we can find some suggestive references. Here, it is a task before the Ambedkar scholars to substantiate Ambedkar's general claim that the three principles can be found in Buddhism. Now, equality. In the revolution and counter-revolution in, uh, in ancient India, Ambedkar highlights the Buddha's fight against inequality. According to him, in the Buddha's time, the principle of inequality, which is the basis of the caste system, had become well established, and it was against this principle that Buddha carried on a determined and bitter fight. Here Ambedkar cites the Ambatha Sutta in his support. Book 3, Part 5, Sections 4 of the Buddha and his Dhamma Dhamma to be Saddhamma must pull down all social barriers. That is the title of the section. He devoted to the discussion of equality in the Buddha's teaching. Here Ambedkar explains how the equality taught by the Buddha contrasts with the principle, namely, the fittest is the best. This section includes references to the dialogues such as Asalayana Sutta, Vasetha Sutta, Esukari and Esukari Sutta of Madhyamanikaya. It may be noted in passing that Ambedkar in the Hindu social order terms this notion of equality as moral equality. Then he also, Ambedkar also talks about economic equality. The Buddha of Ambedkar was mainly against the inequalities caused by the caste system. But according to Ambedkar, the Buddha was also concerned with inequalities in a more general way, including those caused by class conflicts. According to him, the Buddha gives analysis and solution of the problem of class struggle in terms of greed, craving, and control over them. 
gender in gender equality. Ambedkar shows how the Buddha's egalitarian approach cuts across gender differences while narrating the event of Mahaprajapati's conversion. According to Ambedkar, the Buddha offered to Ananda the following clarification of his position on Mahaprajapati's conversion. Ananda, do not misunderstand me. I hold that women are as much capable as men in the matter of reaching Nibbana. I am not an upholder of the doctrine of sex inequality. Then the next principle, fraternity. Ambedkar does not talk explicitly about fraternity in Buddhism, in the Buddha and his Dhamma, but in another work, namely Riddles of Hinduism, Ambedkar explicitly identifies fraternity with the Buddhist principle called Maitri. I quote, what sustains equality and liberty is fellow feeling, what the French Revolution is called fraternity. The word fraternity is not an adequate expression. The proper term is what the Buddha called Maitri. This gives us a key to understand how Ambedkar was locating fraternity in Buddhism. So let us see how Ambedkar discusses Maitri in the Buddha and his Dhamma. In the Buddha and his Dhamma, Ambedkar discusses Maitri in the context of Saddhamma. The title of the book, 3, part 5, section 3 of the book is Dhamma to be Saddhamma must promote Maitri. In this section, he discusses three principles, namely Shila, Karuna and Maitri. And there he attaches greatest importance to Maitri. He translates Maitri as love for all living beings. Ambedkar virtually identifies fraternity with social democracy. He also understands it as an associated form of life with free communication. Ambedkar must have found this feature in the democratic socio-political system of the Vajjins, which the Buddha praises in Mahaparinibbana Sutta. In the Buddha and his Dhamma, there is a section called Sermons on Socio-Political Questions. In this section, Ambedkar refers to the Buddha's appreciation of the state of the Vajjins, which is based on social democracy. Then we come to liberty. Like fraternity, Ambedkar also does not discuss liberty explicitly in the Buddha and his Dhamma. Here we have to notice one problem about liberty as a principle of social life. Liberty has been interpreted in terms of some inalienable rights, right to limb of and life, right to movement, right to choose a profession, right to property, and so on. But the concept of right in a modern context uh, is, a, is a modern concept. In ancient cultures, the individual was an integral part of a social system, and hence he or she had duties towards the society. But the question of the rights of a free or independent individual did not arise. So should we say that we are wrongly attributing the modern idea of liberty to the Buddha? The answer may not be simple, but it may be possible to attempt a twofold answer. One, the concepts of duty and right are logically interconnected. For example, a duty of one person may imply a right of another person. Hence, although the language of duty is used explicitly, the language of rights could be implied. Two, though the notion of rights is not found in ancient literature, the kindred notion of freedom, swatandriya, is found. For example, Manu says that women do not deserve swatantriya as men. Charvakas have gone on record to say that though moksha in the sense of cessation of the cycle of births and deaths is not acceptable as a goal of life, moksha as swatantriya is acceptable. The concept of liberty can be understood 
in terms of freedom of speech, freedom to choose one's profession and so on, even if we avoid the language of rights, so the question of liberty can be reframed in terms of freedom. It should be noted here that when we identify liberty with freedom, the latter should be understood as freedom to rather than freedom from. Here we should not confuse liberty with liberation, that is moksha, because here we are talking about human context in which we are talking about uh, liberty, we are concerned with liberty, which is, sorry, there is freedom, which is freedom to do something. Now we can ask the question whether the Buddha supported freedom of thinking, freedom of speech, freedom to choose one's profession, freedom to acquire property and so on. In the Buddha and his Dhamma, Ambedkar tries to show that the Buddha did support freedom of various kinds. Though the Buddha was committed to morality, universal and sacred morality, and moral disciplining of oneself, the morality he, sp he prescribed was not based on scriptural authority or divine commandment. It was based on free and rational thinking. Hence, in the Buddha's thought, human freedom and morality went together. In his interpretation of Buddhism, Ambedkar highlighted freedom of thought. He depicted the Buddha as anti-authoritarian. In other religions, the supreme unquestionable authorities such as God and sacred scriptures are, were accepted. The Buddha of Ambedkar did not appeal to authority of God or a religious scripture. He appealed to rationality. Ambedkar insists that the Buddha claim, claimed no place for himself in his own Dhamma. Again, there is no explicit discussion of freedom of speech or freedom of action in the Buddha and his Dhamma, but the way Ambedkar depicts the personality and life of the Buddha shows how Bodhisattva Gautama emphasized these democratic forms of freedom. When there was a conflict between the Shakyas and the Koliyas over the distribution of water of the river Rohini, and there was pressure on Bodhisattva Gautama to participate in war, the Bodhisattva opposed this pressure by exercising the freedom of speech and action. Even after attaining the enlightenment, the Buddha did not thrust his views on others by working miracles or by claiming a supernatural authority, but by entering into dialogue and discussion and by encouraging discussion. Freedom of thought and speech become meaningful and fruitful if the society is educated Liberty principle in this way requires the spread of knowledge in philosophy of uh, spread of knowledge. In philosophy of Hinduism, Ambedkar emphasizes knowledge made available to all as the necessary social condition of execution of the liberty principle. This is reflected in his interpretation of Buddhism also. While explaining, explaining Pradnya, in a novel way, Ambedkar shows how the promotion of Pradnya implied that learning should be made open to all. Similarly, in, the Bud in Buddha or Karl Marx, Ambedkar refers to everyone's right to learn as a part of the creed of the Buddha. Spread of knowledge among all the strata of people is necessary for people uh, for proper execution of the liberty principle and this according to Ambedkar was implied by the Buddhist principle of Pradnya. The next form of freedom refers to the right to choose one's profession. There is no explicit statement regarding this right in the Buddha and his Dhamma. However, the principle of right livelihood, Samyak Ajiva, is relevant to this right. It implies that one may choose one's profession by applying moral criteria. This can be contrasted with the Brahmanical approach to the choice of profession which imposed caste criteria, gave more freedom to higher caste and no freedom to the lowest caste and in this way imposed an immoral and unjust hierarchy. Last in the list would be the right to property. Ambedkar has a complex approach which could be called an ambivalent approach as well to this and it is also reflected in his writings on Buddhism. 
As an advocate of liberty, he advocates the right to property, but due to influence of Marxism, he has also before him the ideal of abolition of private property. And he sees both these approaches reflected in Buddhism. In his interpretation of Buddhism, Ambedkar emphasizes that the Buddha did not glorify poverty. Here Ambedkar says, the Buddha has not said, blessed are they who are poor. So there is nothing wrong in becoming rich, in accumulating property, provided that one does that by moral means. In this context, Ambedkar refers to the Buddha's conception of the happy householder. The Buddha described the fourfold happiness of the householder, happiness of profession, happiness of enjoyment, happiness of freedom from debts, and happiness of blamelessness. This was indirectly Buddha's acknowledgement of the right to property. One of the pertinent questions Ambedkar poses in the Buddha and his Dhamma is, could the Buddha answer Karl Marx? Ambedkar gives an affirmative answer to the question in his essay, Buddha or Karl Marx. There he claims that a part of the creed of the Buddha was the view that private ownership of property brings power to one class and sorrow to another, and that it is necessary for the good society that this sorrow be removed by removing its cause. He also finds this conviction, uh, conviction in Marx. Ambedkar's fascination for Marx was because of latter's emphasis on the ideal of classless society based on equality principle. But Ambedkar wanted that the equality principle should be counterbalanced by the other two principles, namely liberty and fraternity. This was possible in a democratic setup where the democracy was not only political but also social. Ambedkar probably believed that Buddhism promotes a social structure in which such a balance between the three principles is established. It was in this sense that the Buddha answers Karl Marx according to Ambedkar. As I have said before, any great religion makes an appeal to humanity and not to narrow sense of nationality. Hence, even a religious perspective is used as a vehicle for nation building. It, ha it has to build not a narrow sense of the nationality, but a wider sense uh, which looks at nation as a part of the global society. At the same time, any religion should not impose itself on the whole society, but it should develop the spirit of living with other religions peacefully and progressively. The term progressively is significant because every religion has to examine itself in terms of modern conditions and modern value, values. Before I conclude, I would like to mention a few more features of Buddhism as interpreted by Ambedkar, which are con conducive to building a human society in general and society of a nation in particular. One, Ambedkar emphasizes morality as the essence of Buddhism. In fact, he claims that Buddhism is not a religion, but it is Dhamma. By Dhamma, he means universal and sacred morality. Two, Buddhism, according to Ambedkar, is not a private or individualistic way of life, but it is essentially social. Three, Buddhism, according to Ambedkar, is not a ritualistic and superstitious religion, but it accords with scientific temper and rationality. Four, According to Ambedkar, Buddhism supports democratic way of life where decisions are not imposed by an authority, but they are taken by mutual consultation. Decisions are reached through dialogues and not by commands. Though Ambedkar was a five, though Ambedkar was a critic of Hinduism because, the, because of the caste system and gender inequality held in it, he was not an enemy of Hinduism. Even when he decided to embrace Buddhism, he continued to perform the role of reform, reformer of Hinduism through constitution making and constit, uh, constituting the Hindu code bill. Just as the Buddha was playing a due role when he had a critical dialogue with the representatives of Brahmanism, he organized an alternative form of religious life 
by forming Sangha. On similar lines, Ambedkar played a dual role, that of a critic of Hinduism and leading an alternative religious culture of modern Buddhism, which he called Navayana. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We now have the clarifications. In case anybody wants any clarifications regarding whatever he has said, kindly raise your hands. It is not unique about Buddhism. If you go to Hinduism also, if you go to, you know, like uh, certain things, I think they are there. In Islam it is there. In Sikhism it is there. So how is it special about Buddhism? And that's what I thought, Buddhi of course, I mean, he's a hero for me, Ambedkar. He's a hero for me. I wrote three, four articles in, for seminars and all that. But what I think, he has uh, interpreted uh, religion to suit his own thinking. That's what it is my, I, I'm not a great critic and all that, but you know, that's what I think, you know, mm. as a thinking person. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I may like to defer. Uh, I mean, if you read uh, Ambedkar's works like Adihilation of Caste, yeah. it goes into minute details, and he also suggests that maybe you can accept Upanishads as your sacred text, where all you can find all the three principles. So the point is that it is quite possible that, I mean, in every religion, there are saints and there is also some kind of orthodox approach. Now, it is possible that the orthodox approach or does not always permit all the three principles in, a, in the ideal form, whereas there are movements in every religion uh, which are launched by uh, saintly people who emphasize morality rather than, ortho say, orthodoxy. They, they emphasize such principles as equality of all beings before God and so on and so forth. Such principles may be there in the religious text also, but in, sometimes we have to uh, examine the text, examine the tradition, and reform is also necessary. Ambedkar was born as a Hindu and he thought that uh, in Hinduism, certainly such a reform is necessary. And uh, it is one thing to say that, yes, there are these principles also in Hinduism, and to say that uh, they are there in every important text which is accepted by Hindus as their religious text. I'd like to uh, know about it. Because what Ambedkar believed in, it came into the constitution as he was an important architect of it. And on simultaneously, he also later embraced Buddhism. So how did he see nation building through the constitution, vis-a-vis -vis his adopting Buddhism? I mean, how did he see the role of religion in that? And I would like to understand how did he, because he had crafted the constitution. So he could have also said, I mean, hypothetically, that let us embrace the constitutional values even more. So he also then asked his followers to adopt Buddhism. So how do you see, uh, you know, I... Uh, I mean, constitution is basically uh, a, a kind of uh, political document, how uh, the government should be run, how laws should be made. And in that, religion has a certain place. Yeah, so we cannot say that instead of our religious scriptures, let us now have constitution as our religious scripture. Yeah. So I mean, that, no, I am just saying, I mean, I am not as, uh, uh, I mean, uh, say, debating with you, but uh, what, that is what I am saying, that, uh, so constitution gives certain status to religions. And then, so this is one issue that there should be, uh, I mean, all religions are uh, to, to be treated equally uh, before constitution. This is one approach. Now, when, when there is a freedom to follow any religion, there is also freedom to critically exam, examine any religion and then also to convert, <laughs> to get converted into another religion. So that is also permitted by constitution. 
So this is a different type of uh, exercise. This, this is a different type of, uh, say, uh, say uh, the practice. I mean, the, he was involved in, where he was mainly concerned with the social issues, and the, he was uh, leading certain uh, masses which were facing. Uh, uh, the untouchable, the evils of untouchability and all that for centuries together. And so, and when he found that it is not possible to, say, convince Hindu leaders to uh, take radical steps, drastic steps to remove untouchability, then it, beca it became necessary for him to uh, take a drastic decision of that type. Professor Gokhale, would it not be right when America speaks of the Constitution and there he is speaking of how law has to ensure liberty, you know, and therefore equality under the law, whereas his thrust has also been that Religion has equality, religion has liberty, and that must also be emphasized. Okay. Yeah. Would that be? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, I mean, I think he uh, discusses these three principles at the level of both constitution as well as religions, and that is based on his distinct. <laughs> principles and rules, that is, a religious life or a religion should be, is governed by principles. Religion should not make rules, whereas government has to make rules. So, uh, I mean, at, at the bottom there have to be principles which will be reflected in the form of rules. So, constitution can make rules, it, it has that authority. Religion does not have authority to make rules and govern people by, by rules. So at both the levels, these principles become important. 